again, we'll conclude this week by turning back to China and see how ancestor cults have been practiced there from time immemorial. Indeed, in this video, I'll be dealing with what can be referred to as ancestor worship in China. For thousands of years, this worship was an integral part of Chinese state doctrine until the empire's abolition in 1911. It is a founding principle of the organization of Chinese society. Today, this worship is still practiced by a majority of Chinese, but in new forms. Let's see how this worship was born, what it consisted of, and what it became. By the end of the Neolithic period, in small rural communities, people were burying the bones of deceased ancestors in the corner of the cottage, under the place where the harvested seeds were stored and would sometimes mysteriously germinate. At that time, it was believed that the souls of the dead people roomed in that corner, waiting to be reincarnated in a newborn, and that each family had a given number of souls who could disincarnate and reincarnate at infinitum within the same group, and so was the foundation of ancestor worship. Very early in antiquity, during the Shangyin dynasty, the king was considered to be the link between heaven and man. He was the only one who could worship to the gods of soil and millet and to heaven, and he could succeed in calming the powerful gods of mountains and rivers responsible for natural disasters. The king practiced these rituals by invoking the mediation of his own ancestors. To encourage a vassal to be loyal, the king attributed to him a number of ancestors to honor. The vassal was given the right to build his own temple where he kept the tablets bearing the names of each of his ancestors. By obtaining an ancestral line, the knighted vassal could rely on the survival of his soul after death. In case of a serious action by the vassal, a uh, rebellion for example, the king could reduce the number of his ancestors or eliminate its entire line by destroying his family temple or burning the tablets of his ancestors. Confucius was shocked by the decadent attitude of his fellow citizens. He said that a truly virtuous man is the one who strictly follows the rites, and among the rites prescribed by Confucius, we note those concerning the family and ancestor worship. The most important one is filial devotion. Each generation has a number of rights and duties with respect to other generations. The eldest son is the only one who can practice worship of his ancestors, ensuring by this way the survival of their souls in the afterlife. This is a major reason why people absolutely wanted a son. When ancestor worship was performed perfectly, the family got protection and could enjoy happiness in three ways. Long lineage, Fu honors within the public service, lu, and longevity, shou. Confucius then based the social order on family order. Like the son who must respect his father, the father must respect his lord, the lord must respect his supervisor, and the supervisor of the supervisors must respect the king, later the emperor, the father of the nation who must respect heaven. In return, everyone had duties towards his inferiors. First, institutionalized for political purposes, ancestor worship became a state religion enabling the production of disciplined citizens. What did ancestor worship consist in? There were ceremonies during which the king practiced the sacrifices of many victims pigs, dogs, cattle, sheep, even sometimes human beings. He was helped by the Wu, a kind of sorcerer able to negotiate with the evil. 
the number and the nature of the sacrificed victim on a particular day to a particular ancestor could be fixed thanks to divination. In the case of the ancestors of the common people, sacrifices symbolizing death and renewal were offered during fall and spring. Sacrifices to the ancestors of the high nobility were more frequent. Different types of sacrifices were offered as prescribed according to the evolution of civilization. In the beginning, there was heaven, so Chinese people offered blood because it's the most uncivilized food. Distant ancestors did not know the use of fire, so they were entitled to raw meat, blood, taste as big soup called da geng and dark drink, which was in fact water. To the nearest ancestors, who themselves had been a part of the civilized world, people offered tasty food and alcohol. Spicy delicacies and sweet beer represent the refined achievement of the society of the time. The ceremonies concluded with banquets, during which the descendants ate that food intended to the nearest ancestors and drank a large amount of alcoholic beverages. The ceremonies could sometimes even end in orgy, especially by the end of the Shang dynasty. Over the centuries, the practice of ancestor worship extended to all layers of society. Everyone had his own family temple or small domestic altar. In the 17th and 18th centuries, the ancestor worship was the focus of major debates between Chinese people and Western missionaries. This is what has been called the Chinese rights controversy. The question was whether the tribute to ancestors was religious or not and therefore could be considered by the church as superstitious or not. The controversy ended with a ban on Christianity decreed by Emperor Yongzheng in 1724. Only few missionaries were allowed to stay at the court thanks to their scientific knowledge. Nowadays, in China and in the countries of Chinese culture, people continue to practice the ancestor worship and the notion of filial devotion persists. At home, on a small altar, one displays the photo of the deceased parent, tablets with his or her names and dates, incense and offering cups in which there are fruit like peaches symbolizing longevity. The tributes to the ancestors by family member could be daily, weekly or during festivals. The third day of the third lunar month is called Qingmingjie, is the Feast of Pure Radiance. It's the equivalent of our All Saints days. People honor their dead by cleaning their graves and offering them a meal. They burn incense, candles and paper money to make sure that the ancestors lack of nothing in the afterlife. And at the same time, the family takes this opportunity to gather for a banquet. Now, in the 21st century, it's also possible to honor our ancestors on the internet. Indeed, websites provide a fully customizable virtual shrine dedicated to one of our ancestors. Firecracker noise can be programmed to warn him that we are thinking of him or her. We can choose to add flying butterflies, which is a homophone of the word longevity, and flowers. Dishes can be selected, as well as a little boy, symbolizing a grandson, making devotion for us. Our ancestors can be sure that they will always be pampered. I hope you have enjoyed this week about the netherworld and the afterlife in various cultural areas. For next week, I invite you to put your wings on, since we shall be concerned with the lofty realities of the heavenly sphere and the belief that these realities have generated in humankind, again in a wide range of civilizations. <laughs>